Great to see all of you tonight. Great to have you here, Pastor. Thank you. We, this is to be a lot of fun. The first five books, Moses, the scriptures, the Pentateuch, has really uh, covers a lot of ground. In a sense, it's a survey course to cover those five books in, in 15 some odd weeks is a challenge. So really what we will do is, I'm not, this is not like I'm going to teach verse by verse through those, never get through Genesis. But we will, you'll be given reading assignments with questions about them so that you read through the five books of Moses and then we will hit key doctrines as we go through them and dig deep on those. And uh, obviously when we get into Genesis, some of you know a lot about the stories there, so I want to teach you the things you don't know in Genesis, not the things you do know. That will be the, that will be the emphasis. And something you do know, we'll dig deeper on it than you know. That will be our goal. And I think we'll, we'll pray, we'll get into this, we'll take a break after about an hour, and then I'll give you some of it, we'll let you know about your first assignment, some of those kinds of things. But let's pray and let's, let's go right to the scriptures. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to teach your word, to hear your word, to learn by it, and that we would be instructed by these things and the things that we hear and see tonight, that you would bring them back to us as we need them. Uh, for our own lives and ministering to others. We ask this, that they, they, we, there would be some great learning and some great joy as we look at the truth in these scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Bring your anointing upon us to accomplish this. In Jesus' name. Amen? Okay. If you have Bibles, it's best to stay along with me here. We'll start with our theme. Our first book is Genesis. Does you understand where the, actually the word comes from? Genesis does mean beginning. But it's not just the beginning of creation. In Genesis is the beginning of every major biblical doctrine. So when, when something's happening in Genesis that really, you know, starts, initiates a new doctrine, we'll let you know. And uh, so you can, you can see them develop. If you will, the word Genesis itself comes from a Greek word meaning beginning. And this was when the Hebrew Scriptures in about 250 BC were translated into Greek. They had 70 scholars who were brought from, from Israel to Alexandria, Egypt. And because there were 70 scholars, it has been known ever since as a Septuagint. Well, when they translated the Septuagint, they changed some of the names of, of what the Jews used to, used to call different books. For instance, the original Hebrew Bible in the Torah, the name of the book is In the Beginning. And the, and the reason was very simple. They were working from scrolls, not from books. And you, and you found a book by finding the first three words. You're rolling the scroll out looking for In the Beginning or whatever book it is. So many of the Hebrew titles are simply the first three words in Hebrew. Well, they did a little something different, but the, the term and the word Genesis is, is, is apropos, it's perfect, because this is the beginning of the Bible, it's the beginning of major doctrines, it's the beginning of human history, and a lot of other beginnings. So it is, you know, if you will, it could even be better called the Genesis. I don't know if you can do that, plural. But there are more than one beginnings here. Now, Oh, you're looking at your homework here. Just maybe you just take a look at this. Okay, I'm gonna hand it to you later. I haven't printed it yet. You are going to find for me five great events in the book of Genesis. Name of the event and and the scriptural references for them. That's your that's your first assignment. Not too hard, but actually it's a it's an interesting way to get you to read the book. But you'll learn something too. This is a big part of the course that you read the book yourself. All right, if you read the book, you get more out of the class. And then secondly, you're going to list 11 great and godly men from the book of Genesis. All right, that's, that's how you're going. That's your reading assignment for Genesis. And I'll hand these out to you. We'll print these and hand these out to you. And I even gave you the first one. i make it easy on you, okay? All right. So, a little bit of uh, how someone would look at this from a Jewish perspective. The first five books, we call them the books of Moses, are known as the Torah. 
So if you hear someone Jewish speaking, they're reading from the Torah. This is what they're reading. Then there is a more general use of the word Torah to speak of all of the Hebrew Bible. But technically, the Torah means those first five books. And so they would call it the Torah or the law. So, you see them Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And uh, we've talked about the Pentateuch. Let's, let's, let's move on from there. Just to give you an idea, when I say the beginning, the beginning of what? The beginning of life on earth as we know it. The beginning of the human race. The beginning of a proper, happy, marital relationship. The beginning of man's fall from grace. The beginning of the restoration from the fall from grace. The beginning of messianic prophecies. The beginning of the trail of blood. You look, we'll look at that as we go through this. The mention of blood every time it's mentioned in the scriptures. That, that trail of blood begins in Genesis and goes to the cross. We, and we actually see it carried on right through to the book of Revelation. Uh, the beginning of righteousness with God by faith. Being right with God by faith begins in Genesis. The beginning of languages, people groups, and nations, they all begin in the book of Genesis. The beginning of the Jewish nation, the beginning of circumcision and the promises that came with it, the beginning of tithing. The beginning of good health habits. I don't know, we'll get into them a little bit here. It, it, may not, it won't kill any of you, don't worry about that. But we will look at it a little bit. The beginning of biblical numerology. Numbers have meaning in the Bible. We will learn them and you'll be tested on them. Okay? They will add to your understanding of the scriptures. The beginning of biblical symbolism and types. And obviously the beginning of the types of Christ. That is a partial list of all the beginnings that we'll be looking at. All right? So, I, I may have gone a little too fast for you there. Now, you do know this will be posted on, on YouTube. So, if you miss something, just go back and look through the class. And we leave them on. You, I, you know, so you, you can go back and look at them. All right. Now, though the book of Genesis does not contain a record in itself. But Genesis doesn't say who wrote Genesis. The compelling evidence is that Moses was the author of all the first five books of the Bible. And I'm going to give you the, the evidence we have to believe that Moses wrote these books. Uh, one of the things is an interesting clue, and you, will, you would not see it unless someone pointed out to you. You have Exodus, I mean, you have Genesis and Exodus, when you open the book of Exodus and look at what it says, it says, now these are the names. That word now is a Hebrew prefix, and it means, it means, it indicates that there was something before the now. You don't get that in the English. <laughs> well, if there's something before the Exodus, well, that's the book of Genesis. And it's the idea that that there was a connection, that when Moses wrote those, he was thinking, well, this is going to be the first book, the second book, that he planned these five books out. That's a little clue. By itself, it would not be enough to indicate Moses, but it does give you an idea that they, they connected in some way. Then, several times, the scriptures say this, it is stated several times that these books, were, that Moses was told to write down what God told, told to him. So here's, here's one of those quotes, Exodus 24, 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Oh. Now, this gets interesting. There was a period in the 20th century where modern scholars bashed the Bible saying, this was not written by Moses. In that period of time, the Hebrews had not yet developed a written language. It is impossible. Someone made it up much later on. Well, then the archaeologists did a little more digging, and guess what they found? They found proof that, yes, there was a complete, uh, full Hebrew language in the time of Moses. That shut their mouths. Of course, those things they print just stay circulated. The idiocy stays in print for a long time. But we know they had a developed written language. And, and so Moses wrote. 
So Moses broke all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Several places it says that he wrote. So that means there was a written record to pass on from generation to generation. Now, watch how Jesus refers to it. In Luke 16.31, Jesus um, is telling a story. He's telling the story of Lazarus and the rich man when they die and in Abraham's bosom or in what we would call hell. And he goes like this. Jesus is telling the story and he says, And he said unto him, meaning in this story, Abraham, Father Abraham said, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. What did he call the Old Testament scriptures? Moses and the prophets. So if the Lord considered the author to be Moses, we consider the author to be Moses. It's, uh, to me, that you don't need any other proof. All right. So that's how Jesus referred to it. In a story he was telling, Moses and the prophets. Uh, if you want the other references, I'm not going to read them all there. You know, Luke 24, 44, John 5, 46, and 47. Uh, John 7, 23, actually is a place where circumcision, which is part of the law of Moses, is mentioned. Let's see. I'll, I will read Luke 24, 44, just to nail down this thing that Jesus considered Moses to be the author. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law, the law of Moses and the prophets and the psalms concerning me. So this is the Lord's reference to those first books being the books of Moses, written by Moses. Let's see. Now, just to answer some of the critics, there have been people who have studied other documents at the time and say, well, you know, there's things in the book of Genesis and things that Moses wrote that were similar to things that were already written by secular sources. And apparently this is an attempt to discredit that it was divinely inspired. How many have heard the expression, uh, all truth is God's truth? Yeah. If God finds something in the secular culture that people are saying is true, he's not above putting it in the book. And I'll show you cases for that. The most funny one is in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul does that. You look at the picture there. He's writing to Titus, who's been sent to the island of Crete. And the Crete culture of that day uh, apparently um, it promoted laziness and, how would we say it, uh, obesity, overeating. So Paul, telling Titus to go after the congregations to not be like their own culture and be different, he quotes, one, he quotes a secular prophet or poet. So, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. I don't think I have to tell you what the slow bellies refers to. Okay? But, you know, so that's what... Now, Paul is quoting a secular uh, source, ripping into the, the, this culture. He wants Titus to preach for these people to be different than the culture they come from. So he quotes this prophet, a prophet of their own. Now that's in the Word of God. It, he was inspired to take something from the secular culture and put it in the Scriptures. So if Moses did the same thing, well, he's... Hey, it's the truth. And God got it from wherever he got it. And I, my own opinion is this. If God can speak through Balaam's ass, he can speak through a secular writer when he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put it right out there for you, okay? <laughs> so, and then the truth, it's very interesting where different things came to us in the scriptures. But God says it's true, I'm putting it in the book. All right? And very interesting. Now, the other thing that we see here, Romans says that God has written his laws in our hearts. Meaning someone who has never read the Bible, understands inherently some of the things written in the Law of Moses. That when God instructed Moses to write on two tablets of stone, 
and then brought those stones to the people. The things that were written on that stone, according to Paul and Romans, were already written in men's hearts. So the sense of justice, right and wrong, there are certain things that are universal. God made us that way. We are his moral agent. And so this is one of the reasons why if God's laws are written in your heart, then as a Gentile, at times, you will speak things that are in the book without reading the book. Because the law is written in your heart. So Romans 2.14 is very clear. And when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature, and that's what he says, they do by nature the things contained in the law, these have a not the law, or a law unto themselves. Now Paul was a first-hand witness of this. He grew up in a Gentile city in a Jewish home. And he watched these Gentiles. And he realized at times they did things that were commanded in the law of Moses, but they had not read the law of Moses. The law was written in their heart. So this is how we can get something in the scriptures, even from a secular source. Now, uh, the overall picture is Moses, who had an ongoing, if you will, face-to-face -face relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That he obviously could be inspired to write that which is true and what God wanted him to. Just ever a man, you know, he is the type, the Old Testament type of Christ. Moses says, a prophet like unto me will come, listen to him. So he said, the Messiah is going to be like me. Well, Moses was inspired to write what he wanted. There's no question about his ability to write something that was inspired. Now, we'll, take, we'll begin here with Genesis 1.1. And if you will, if you want great faith, this is the only verse in the Bible you need to believe. You get that? Well, let's, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you can believe that, the rest of the book is easy. If he can make the heavens and the earth, then there's nothing else that he cannot do, and we have no lack of faith. This is the only hard verse to believe in the Bible. The, everything else is downhill. It's easy. And we're, we're actually going to, a little bit with you, to show you why that is so true. We're going to make, bring that out in a minute. Now, the word create, and you'll actually, you'll see this on your midterm, barra. And, it, and this is the word God uses when he wants to make something out of nothing. So the only, when you see this verb barra, the only noun that you can put before it as a subject is God. Because he is the only one who can make something out of nothing. So when it says God, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it, it really speaks of creating something brand new that was not previously there. Let's see, I've, here's some different places how it's used in the scriptures. Look at the things that, are, that he speaks of creating, making out of nothing. You see it for in, uh, we mentioned Genesis 1.1. Humanity, man is made, you know, out of the dust in Genesis 1.27, using that word bara. The heavenly host in Isaiah 40.26. The ends of the earth in, in, uh, in Genesis 40.28. In Psalm 89, 12, righteousness. He can create righteousness in a person that was not in any way righteous. Salvation is a creation made by God. In Isaiah 45, 8, even evil. Not that God directly made evil, but he did things so that the possibility of evil could happen. All right, so that's in Isaiah 45, 7. David actually asked God to create, to bara, make a clean heart in me that is not there to create something out of nothing. That's what, how David prayed. And Isaiah promised that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. Again, Bada, making something out of nothing in Isaiah 65, 17. It's a very special word. It's a very special work. Now, theologians have a word for this, or two words, ex nihilo. And it's a Latin phrase that means out of of nothing. And this concept, uh, creato ex nihilo, creation out of nothing, is used in philosophy, it's used in theology, it's used in some other areas. 
it is, we're going to look at this because this ex nihilo, the person walking the street who is not a Christian in the United States of America and in most of the, if you will, the, uh, the Western world or maybe even in the Eastern world too, believes, they don't know it, but they believe in an ex nihilo in a different shape and form. We're going to talk about it. This is something that you can identify with people and should use it when you share your faith. Now, oh, let's see. Okay. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork in Psalm 91 1. I don't know how fast you're watching this. First of all, how is it that the heavens declare the glory of God? And once you take your whiteboards, you're going to help me with this a little bit. First of all, see if you any of you have an idea. How many stars in our Milky Way, our galaxy? Give me a number. Put it down on your whiteboard. I think if you're looking quick, I already gave it to you if you're watching real fast. Okay, how many stars in the Milky Way? That's spiral galaxy that we're in. Someone put some numbers up there, so let's see what you got. See, see where you are with this. 200. Add a few zeros on it. 120,000 stars. 3 billion stars. Okay, that's the numbers I'm getting. Now, here we go. You don't actually count them, by the way. One, two, we'll count your zeros. Three, four. How many zeros there? I don't even know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, let me look at this here. Let's uh, say one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. That would make, if I put a one there, we'd have a million, right? What we need to do is this. We need to go beyond. That makes a million. Okay, that would be a hundred millions. Yeah, I got to make them zero smaller. Sorry, folks. count here. I do know what I'm doing. I think. There's a million. There's a billion. Oh. Let's see. A million. A billion. Oh, now, now you need a little erasing. Not a lot. The average size galaxy in our universe has a hundred billion stars in it. One universe, I mean, one, one, excuse me, one galaxy. One galaxy has a hundred billion stars. Our Milky Way, generally, and I, not everybody estimates it's the same, but generally speaking, when you look at some different sources, 200 billion stars in one galaxy, our galaxy. The average one is a hundred. They don't count a galaxy until you have 600,000 stars. That's a small one. So a small galaxy has 600,000. An average one has 100,000. The Milky Way, 200, well, what do we got? 200, yeah, million, 200 million, 200 billion. Yeah, 200 billion stars. Now, the largest galaxy that they have looked at, that can see from the Hubble Space Telescope, has a trillion stars in it. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. Now the question is, well, if that's one galaxy, how many galaxies do we have? Anybody want to take a guess? Try your numbers again. How many galaxies are there in the universe that we can see from our telescopes? How many, how many galaxies are there? Give me a number again. Try a number. It's interesting that nobody had enough zeros out there. <laughs> then we're going to do a real math problem with you. Don't worry, I'll be the only one on the whole course. <laughs> one math problem, 15 weeks, you'll survive that. I, I might sneak another one. Not that I know. Caitlin is just making zeros crazy here. Forget about counting. I can't be sure. All right. Anybody else? Let me see anybody on numbers there. Let's see this. I gotta count this. Let's see. You got 
You didn't put in the commas. You're making this hard on me. Put the commas. <laughs> I count by threes. Right? That's how you count these big numbers. A million, billion, ten trillion. Okay. Here's what, here's what I, 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 I looked I look this one up today. You have ten billion, ten billion galaxies. So, what we got to do, you see this number here? We're, we're going to multiply here. We're going to take the average galaxy has 100 billion stars. See the zeros? You got it on your boards? You ready for this? And you're going to multiply this times, let's see. Let's get going here. Now we got a million, but we need, that would be, we need billions. Here we go. Is that 10 billion look like? Millions are here, billions are here, yeah, 10 billion. So, no problem, we're just gonna multiply 10 billion galaxies times 100 billion stars, and that's how many stars there are in the visible universe. Now, does anybody remember the math trick to do this? You don't really multiply, what do you do, folks? Add the what? Add the zeros, thank God. <laughs> All right, so we have to do this. We have to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. You leave that because you have a 10, 10 to the 20th. You take a 10 and you put, you put uh, 20 zeros after. That's how many stars are in the universe. Now, what does it say? The heavens declare the what? The glory, the glory of God. <laughs> that they're there, that there are that many of them, obviously speaks of God's <laughs> immense power. Now that's the visible universe. They're building a more powerful telescope than the Hubble. And when it comes, they'll revise these numbers. So, anyways. Uh, let me show you. That's an incredible universe. Oh! Wait, I think I can come up with a name for this. We gotta do. Oh, I gotta do two. If I do it all, I actually I did this with my students before. One, two. Okay, I gotta do a little racing. Let's see if we can get a we get a name for these. This is a little fun. A little science class here. Here we go. We need twenty zeros, right? We got six, nine, twelve, <laughs> fifteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and then a ten. And a, and a, I got a, a one. I think I got this. So this would be a million billion. Did I do this right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. I, think I, I think I may need one more in there. Anyways, so you have a million, a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion, a quintillion. So you have 10 quintillion stars. I guess you could call it that. Something oh like that. Goodness. All right. Still less than now, let's, we're close. Let's go on from there. Fred, can you count those and validate it? Okay. I'll have that next week. All right. We counted them all. That's what I wanted. The visible universe as we know it today, the telescope can see light they believe is coming from 13.8 billion light years away. Meaning how fast light travels in a, in a year, a light year. But light travels at 186,000 miles per second. I don't know how many miles that is. I mean, it's light year. But if that's how far light can travel in one second, a light year is how far away. A hundred, you know, hundred. When they say it's um, what's it? 13.8 billion light years, that's how fast light can travel in that many years, okay? So, you look that way, you can see a star 13, with a telescope, they actually can see a star, light coming from a star, I believe is 13.8 billion light years away. I was gonna say miles. Now, 
Let's do a little comparing here. I'm not a big banger. But I have shared my faith with people and they say, Oh, I don't believe in God, I believe in the Big Bang. My answer to them, please write this in your notes, I want you to use this, say, You do believe in God. They say, Well, I believe in the Big Bang. Oh, you believe in God. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, the Big Bang teaches that this, this on this uh, estimate here is 13.7. The thinking is this. Because we can see light from 13.7 billion light years away, then the universe is 13 point billion years old. That's the thinking with the Big Bang. We'll refute that in a few minutes. That's their thinking. But they are saying, they say, I believe that 13.7 billion years ago, all the matter, every single molecule, every single atom in the universe suddenly appeared. Tell me about this. <laughs> you told me you didn't believe in God. Every single molecule in the atom was created in a moment of time. Is that what you're telling me? Who created it? Okay. Oh, well, I know you just pull rabbits out of hats and this is how we do things. But the truth is, the Big Bang Theory banks a creator. One of the scientists who realized this, who didn't like it at first, was oh, Albert Einstein. As a Jew, and watching many Jews suffer through uh, the Holocaust through World War II, it was, uh, to him it was unthinkable that there was a God who would let people suffer like this. So he was looking for a steady state universe with no creator. Because he, he, he didn't like God's dealings, if you will, with Jews. And I won't get into all that now, but it's, it's, it's too much to do in a class. And so he fudged it. He fudged the math to, 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 so he could skip the creator. And then later on he said, it was the biggest mistake I ever made. You need a creator for this creation. That was a statement. Didn't like the creator, but he admitted that there has to be one. Okay? You just don't make all that stuff out of nothing. Someone has to make it. And so the ex nihilo, creating something out of nothing. How many stars are we making out of nothing? What do we got? Uh, we call it 10 quintillion, 10 to the 20th power. You need a creator for that kind of creation. So the heavens declare the what, folks? Glory the God. glory of God. So. Don't argue with someone about the Big Bang. Simply say, you believe in God. Why? You believe that, and you quote, quote the thing, 13.7 billion years ago, that those you know, 10 to the 20th power of stars, the matter for them was all created in a moment of time. That's the theory that begs an almighty, all-powerful creator. And of course the scripture says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So as far as, you know, Genesis 1-1, you agree with it. It's in that theory. We'll go on, we'll look at some things that are wrong with it. Not, I'm not going to get into it a lot, but I want you to see this, because most people talk about the Big Bang, don't know what they're talking about, they don't know the facts, that they never looked the thing over and studied the thing over and realized that it forces them to believe in God. That's your job. Okay, you can do that with people. All right? And have a little fun with them. Do you pull rabbits out of hats? Show me. Come on, do it. You know? Accidentally, make one star for me, please. Just one. Okay? Make a molecule, please. Come on. How can we do this accidentally? And, you know, well, make them think. All right? You need a creator to have a creation. And that's why the knowledge of God, uh, we're all responsible we can all, we all realize this. In the real world, you need a creator for a creation. All right. Now, let's see. And I'm, this is a quote here from, I went to the BigBangTheory.com website. 13.7 billion years ago, prior to that moment, there was nothing. During and after that moment, there was something. Our universe. All right. Ex nihilo, something out of nothing. The Big Bang Theory is an effort, an effort to explain what happened during and after that moment. Alright. So, now, 
when where did this theory actually come from so you understand the origins of a little bit in California they built the uh, uh, an astronomer working at an organization called Caltech named Edwin Hubble that's where they get the Hubble name for the space telescope he was in charge of the largest telescope in the world and what he actually did is he looked into the heavens and he made a discovery until that point scientists believed that the Milky Way our galaxy was it there were no other stars and he looked and this thing was powerful and he says no 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 that's when that's one of many galaxies there's many many more and all of a sudden you know the size of the universe in people's minds like expanded I shouldn't say a hundredfold or a millionfold or a trillionfold but I, we'd probably have to go beyond that he said that's just one galaxy it's all this is out there and you know you had a fellow scientists take a look with them and they had to agree the other thing from his calculations he believed that the universe what they call the redshift I'm not going to get into that was expanding that we have this huge universe way beyond what people imagine it was expanding if it expanding then they said well it must have started at some central point that's what they call the Big Bang not because there was any noise but they believe they have an expanding universe this is not a scientific fact this is a scientific what folks theory. Theory. theory and one of the things you don't want to get spent too much time is fighting against a theory because tomorrow they go change the theory <laughs> so you study all these scriptures showing how the theory is wrong and then they go to a different theory the next day <laughs> and I actually went on a website who gave scientific evidence why the universe is not expanding and it was really very simple it was embarrassing how simple it was in the calculations they made so these are theories but we know there's certain things we do know about the universe and that's what we teach in the book of Genesis what we know not a theory that comes and goes but that's it was his work and it wasn't that Hubble was so much smarter than anyone else he finally had a telescope powerful enough to prove these things to look at these things this is actually the telescope he looked through and he says we have an expanding universe and and at first Einstein was one of those to to argue with this he didn't want a creation that needed a creator he's forced to believe there is one now look at this this is what we know about our universe people say is it infinite are there an infinite number of stars no and this is in Psalm 147 verse 4 he tells the number of the stars he calls them all by name that's one thing to make them could you imagine keeping track of the name of every star okay it speaks not only of his infinite power but of his infinite knowledge knowing every he knows the position and the use and the whereabouts of every molecule in the universe at every second of time on a continuous basis he has all knowledge and we just don't always think of him having that much knowledge but he has exact knowledge of every detail of the universe <laughs> and that's one of the reasons we know it so in Isaiah 40 26 it says lift up your eyes on high and behold who has created these things <laughs> yes look up there he's created these things that brings out the host by number the host is the host of stars here he calls them all by name by the greatness of his might for that he is strong in power <laughs> not one faileth so that we see in his creation his infinite power and his infinite knowledge we see in other places him as a creator not just in Genesis in Job 37 18 can you with him spread out the skies this is a question asked in the book of Job can you can you spread out the skies he has in his infinite power Job 9 a which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea he is there and present in all of these operations now this is by the way I mentioned someone refuting the Big Bang theory and the expanding universe this is the website if you want to read it yourself I have the notes on I'm not going to do it tonight if you want to look at that it was an article on sciencenews.com it's there 
So we're dealing with a theory. But when someone comes up and they say, I believe in the Big Bang, so you'll believe in God. Go after them. Uh, I'm just going to skip these. You can, if you want, I can even send these to me if you give me an email address. We can do that. Uh, let's see. I want to look at a little bit of one of these here. Let's go back here a little bit. Yes. Yeah, let's see if I need one more on this. Okay, here we go. You see in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, talking about the firmament. And this has created a number of problems. And, I, and I'll explain why. You should understand this. People have attacked the Bible saying that it, it had creation all wrong because of this word firmament. So I want you to see where it comes from. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. It's speaking of dividing the waters that are on the earth from the waters that are in the heavens. Now we know there are great amounts of water in the heavenly bodies. Um, a comet traveling through space is dust and ice. That's what it is. Okay, so there's huge amounts of water in the heavens. But the word firmament, and this is, this is where the problem arose, it's not from the Greek. The word firmament implies a solid material coming from the Latin word firmamentum. And this is in Jerome's Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible. So in Europe, a theology based on that word was developed that is not actually scriptural. However, we look at the original Hebrew word, uh, I guess you would pronounce it rak rakia, and the rakia means something a little different. It means to beat, to stamp, to beat out, or to spread out. So in the Hebrew, when it says the firmament, it simply means to spread out heavens. But the word firmament means a solid object. And so in, in medieval times, Christians were taught as part of theology that the stars were hanging upon a solid dome called a firmament. And the stars were hanging on this thing like you'd hang lights on a Christmas tree, based on that Latin word. But it's not the Hebrew word. The Hebrew firmament means, it can mean several things, but one of them it means is to spread out. And it simply means the stars are spread out the sky. And the heavens are spread out. All right? So if someone says, oh, oh, the Bible says that, you know, that, that there's this dome of creation and the stars are hanging on the dome. Ha, ha, ha. And you go, ha, ha, you don't know you're Hebrew. Okay? You just know, you should know a bad Latin translation here. That's where it comes from. So sometimes, you know, bad theology comes from bad translation. And, 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 and will plague the church because the church bound itself to this. The Catholic theology was bound with this and got involved with this and got it wrong. And then they were made fun of uh, when people began to study the heavens. And, but it wasn't the Hebrew scriptures they were arguing about. It was the Latin translation which was poor. So, let's see, this raka, uh, it, twice it means stamp one's feet, once it means to spread metal, or four times it means that, spreading out the earth three times, spreading the sky or the clouds once. So the verb raka does not necessarily refer to the beating out of a solid object, but to the spreading out process, whether the object is solid or not. It may seem like a little thing, but it, it, it gives you a proper understanding. This is, your Bible is not a science book. But it's the only book that is always completely right when it speaks of science. It was not meant to be a science book, but when it speaks of science, there is no error. And so theories come and go, and the scriptures just stand. Now, we're going to look at one, one theory here, and then we'll take a break afterwards here. There are different theories of interpreting Genesis chapter 1, and you're going to hear about them from different people. How many have heard the term gap theory? Okay. All right. You're looking at the basis of it up there. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The next thing it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, the, the creation week has not yet begun. So before the creation week starts, there is already a planet one. Earth. But it's void, it's chaotic. So what the gap theory teaches, we're going to look at, you know, is that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and that the original heavens and the earth for some reason somehow were destroyed. And that the earth at the beginning of the creation week was was destroyed and chaotic, there was no life on it. So there must have been a previous creation to the creation we see in the creation week. Now that's based on those scriptures. The, the other place in the scriptures that, that, if you will, speaks for that, look at Isaiah 45, 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. Now here's what it says about how he formed the earth. He hath established it and created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. He formed it to be inhabited, but in, in Genesis 1-2, it can't be inhabited in that form. All right. So the idea between these two verses, this is where the gap theory comes from, and we're going to look at what people do with it, is that somehow there was a previous creation. There was some type of destruction, and what was left is a planet Earth void. The gap theory is usually used by people who would like to believe that the dinosaurs and ancient creatures like them existed before the destruction of the Earth, and that's why we have ancient fossils. That's what they use it for. They want to put science, put it in that gap there. The strength for it, I don't, I don't do that. I think, and I'm going to actually show you, I'm going to show you a human footprint overlaid by a dinosaur footprint in a fossil. We have such a thing. It comes from Texas. Got anybody here from Texas? We've got a Texas footprint. I'll show it to you in a few minutes. But anyways, it's there. They're in the same age. And we'll show you dinosaurs and men. Hey, may I have your pet dinosaur walking down the street? Anyways, but at some point, I believe that it was so. Really. But... What it speaks of is God does not, in the Genesis week, speak of the creation of angels. You see, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, we'll look at them tonight. Day six, there's no mention of the creation of angels. So when were the angels made? And there's a little thinking with this. After a six-day creation period, Adam or Eve are in the garden, and the devil speaks through a serpent. Uh -huh. What? So, when did when was the devil made? There are some that believe, like with the stars and the sun, that he was made on day four. If you do that between day four and day seven, two days later, he has to get all the all the, all the uh, angels to rebel with him and have this whole rebellion in two 24-hour days. It doesn't work very well to imagine such a thing. So what most theologians believe is that in eternity past, before the creation that we're going to see take place in Genesis, that the angels were made. They were all made good. They were made in a sense, like us in a sense, like in the image of God. They were directly made by God. Okay? So, now, let's look at the scriptures with this. Okay, let me go from here. I'm going to skip some things here. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm skipping a bunch of verses here, but that's okay. These are all more creation verses. Here it is, yes. And write this in your notes, please. Job 38, 7. If you say, where is the creation of angels in the scriptures? Here it is. In, Genesis, in Job 38, 7, it says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. We're speculating a little bit, because the Bible does not say. It seems to fit with our theology and the rest of the Bible the best that the angelic beings were made before man. They were made before the creation week, 
And it is possible, when it says the earth was formless and void, that the earth formerly was the dwelling place of Lucifer. And that in his fall, it was also destroyed. Now that's all speculation. It will, whether you believe that or not, will not affect your basic theology. But you know, people say, where did the angels come from? When, did, when were they created? But it would best, uh, my best explanation is that they were created in eternity past before the creation week. They would then, in a sense, fit in that gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. The gap does not need to be long. It simply needs enough time for God to make a creation called angels for, the, for one of those angels to, to start a conspiracy and for that angel to be judged, okay, and it causing destruction of whatever was there before. And we're getting into the, the unknown. But most of your um, biblical theologians, evangelical theologians, believe that Lucifer and the angels were created before the creation week. They're not included in the creation week. So, to... What I don't like is when people try to use the gap theory to say that's where the dinosaurs were. Because, according to your Bible, death entered into, not just man, but death entered into, the, into, into planet Earth through Adam's sin. If you put the dinosaurs before Adam, then, they, then, then death is just a natural process and not caused by sin like the Bible says it is. So you're, 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 then you're violating a scriptural principle. Death came through Adam's fall. Death affected the whole universe. All of creation was affected by what Adam did. And that's what the scriptures teach. All right. So we have their creation there. Now, when you read your Old Testament, every place that says sons of God speaks of angels. In the New Testament... Every time it says sons of God, who's it speak of, folks? Yes, I see the hands going up. Old Testament, sons of God are angels directly made by God. Well, what does it say about you? If you pray and you ask Christ to save you and you believe that the blood of Jesus takes away your sins, you're directly made by God. You're part of God's new creation. You are, a, and that's what it says, you are a new creation. In the same way that the angels were the sons of God because they were a new creation directly made by God. You're the new, new creation. Okay? Directly made by God. It's, I mean, that's quite a privilege. So I have been made by God in His image. At the moment I pray to receive Christ. The Bible calls you a new creation. Alright. So, this is, this is the context for that verse in Job if you want to see it there. Where are the foundations fastened, or who laid the cornerstone there when the morning stars sang together? Stars in the Old Testament often speak of angels. Sometimes they, there's, there's a couple of things. In the Old Testament type of thinking, a star can be a comet. Uh, anything that gives light in the night sky can be a star. But it also speaks several times. Angels are referred to as stars. And I believe that's what's going on here. When the morning stars sang together, the angels of God sang on the day that they were created, thanking their creator for the life that they had just begun to enjoy. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. This is an account of the angelic creation in eternity past. All right, let's see. Let's see. And, you know, we, we, oh, wait. this is Job referring to them as, as this. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Who are the sons of God? Angels. Folks? Angels. angels. And Satan, oh, one of those angels, also was among them and presented himself before the Lord. All right. Take a break. Take ten minutes. And we'll, we'll look at that creation week.